sector as you gear up towards graduate school. And I really wanted to emphasize um, specialization, being curious and you know, contribution and what it is that you're, you're thinking long-term of what it is that you're going to be doing. Um, again, as I described my kind of circuitous path and building my own kind of uh, career and cobbling together multiple advanced degrees, it's not always a direct kind of path. It's not just that you get your degree and then you get the job based on that degree. Um, graduate study is, is much broader than that. It's really, it's, um, it's um, I'll talk a little bit more, but it's highly specialized. And so it's building off of some of the general skills that you've got currently um, and that you want to continue building moving forward. And now I'm not moving forward on my slides. We're gonna do that. All right. So when you think about specialization, <clears throat> it's a, a continual process of growing throughout your career. Um, none of us are born knowing particle physics, for example, right? It's something that you specialize in, you kind of go into areas. And so I want you to think more broadly about um, your skills than, than just job and thinking broadly about the skills that you want to develop and what path that might set you on in terms of specialization. Thinking about the number of degrees that are, are conferred every year. I know in the United States broadly, according to census numbers, about 5% of the US adult population holds master's degrees and about 2%, not quite, hold doctoral degrees. Here at CSU, these are our um, stats from the from 2020 to 2021. And you can kind of see the number of bachelor's degrees versus then advanced degrees, certificates, masters, DVMs, which are um, doctorate of veterinary medicine or PhDs. And so as you move forward, you're going to find that in that specialization that you have a, um, a new community of people to have conversations with, new knowledge, um, people to share, it, right? You'll be building new uh, uh, communities within graduate school, but then also postgraduate school and thinking about kind of, there's new opportunities in that as well. I'm having some tech challenges, hold on. There we go. So when you're looking at, at programs, you can think broadly. We have hundreds of programs available here at CSU, certificate, master's, um, doctoral programs. And so it can be a little overwhelming. My recommendation is to narrow it down in a couple of different ways. Find those professors that you're currently working with who have um, backgrounds in the specialty area that you're thinking about going forward in. See what it is that they recommend, what schools, what programs, who do they have connections with and start building through that network already. Also do your research more broadly. Um, I did not go to a graduate school that anyone else had recommended on um, post um, I, from my undergraduate or from um, my master's into my, my graduate uh, work. So thinking pretty broadly about um, where it is that you might want to go, just kind of do some checking. And then you can always find information. We know that the internet is a great source of information, but you can often find the people, the very people that you need to contact there. And you can ask them in kind of an informational interview way, what is it like to be a graduate student on your campus? What are the skills that, that I'm going to be building? What are the expectations for me to pursue a master's degree? Or if I want to, to go on and, and do a doctorate, what, what am I going to be um, looking at? in terms of my kind of expectations and what you're going to be studying. And today's gear up session is fabulous because you get firsthand accounts from lived experiences of graduate students to kind of get a sense of what that might be like. I think being curious as we know is just essential, I think in building relationships and building connections, but also in building your career. Um, it's a place for you to consider what's next. Of course, you know, I'm curious about the, what's going to unfold. It can also, the, the uncertainty of not knowing what's right around the corner can also be a place, a little place of anxiety. So I wanna encourage you to think about being curious in ways that are meeting your challenge kind of level and what it is that you want to be challenged by, but also your skill level and matching those up. Um, know that as you enter into your graduate studies, you're not going to be expected to know everything, right? As I mentioned, no one's um, born knowing particle physics. You start to learn these things as you move forward and being curious and allowing yourself to experience that curiosity as your skill building, super, super helpful. Um, the uh, psychologist Mahaley Chekst, um, me high. Uh, he, his flow um, state is, and description of um, how it is that we move into states of flow 
really, really lovely way to think about how do you manage challenge and skill. And there are certain places where you can get in, into a little bit of trouble. And it doesn't mean that you're not skilled enough to be able to handle it. It just may be that you don't have enough time, right? The challenge is that you're trying to get something done and your, your skill level, you may actually have the aptitude there, but you may not have the time to do it. And so you can move into states of anxiety um, if, you're, if you're stressed about having enough time to do things. So my recommendation is whether you're writing out your projects that you're working on or you are um, putting together your applications, make sure that you set aside enough time for you to be able to really enjoy that process. Curiosity unfolds and you need to be able to engage at a place where you are so that you feel comfortable going, moving through that process. And so here's another example and, and description of um, Csikszentmihalyi's uh, flow state. And where you really wanna be is in this kind of focused and happy place. And I think of that with, with the writers that I work with. And I work with writers who are graduate students. I work with postdocs. I work with research writers. Um, I work with faculty, anywhere from uh, assistant professors all the way through full professors and senior faculty. And in part, because you have to write through your, your, your career. By the way, that's the secret of graduate school is everything that you're doing and all, everything that you're learning, all of that specialty knowledge gets written down. So anybody who's like, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm going into engineering because I don't have to write ever again. Really, you will be a writer. Um, there's, it's, yeah, um, it's in inevitable, right? You have to write a thesis, a dissertation. But the good news is that you can find a place of flow and where you're challenged and you're, you're working in your skill level and your ability. And it, you can find this place where you're just in the groove. So it happens all the time. And I think that there's something incredibly pleasurable about graduate studies. And really long-term, you wanna be thinking about what your contributions are. What are you going to be able to do and give back because of your graduate studies? And there's a lot of pressure. Graduate school can be full of, of pressures of exams or reading pressures, um, mastering new materials, um, writing theses or dissertations, right? But all of those are contributions in various ways. They're the kind of daily contributions that you do, but they can also build and they lead to the, your capacity and your ability to make really significant contributions based on that degree and, and what it is that you, um, you've earned. And so I wanna highlight one of our former um, graduates, someone with a DVM, a doctorate of, of veterinary medicine, Kwane Stewart. And I'll put it in, in the chat, um, the article about him in the Smithsonian Magazine, but he, started working with the homeless populations and doing free veterinary care for the animals that they had. He found that a significant number of animals that had been coming into to shelters were, um, had, had been abandoned or were belonging to people who were on the streets. And so he became the street vet. He'd been doing it for years before the, he, they created a TV show. And um, it's a, a reality TV series but showing how it is that you can go and you can give back. And I think that's a, a natural way for we can, we can think about contribution. But contribution can happen in all kinds of little ways in laboratories, in um, doing interpretations of literary texts in my background um, or writing a, uh, historical documents. If you ever have that moment of where you're thinking, gosh, is this really for me? Do I, do I have what it takes? Can I, can I move forward? Just remember this, that you really, you, you have something to share always, but you also have a lot to learn. And that place, I think, is a great place for being able to build your expertise out of something that is still grounded, that you still know something, you're still, you know, moving forward um, with some purpose, but that you also know that you're going to be learning a fair amount through that process. And that's the, kind of the great gift, I think, of graduate school that you will come out through that process having learned a tremendous amount and being able to give and contribute based on that. That's how you become a specialist or an expert. So if you have any questions or wanna talk about anything, not just writing related, but graduate school related, uh, feel free to reach out to me. It's Quinn with a Y in the middle. So Quinn at colostate.edu and I welcome um, further conversations. And I'm so glad that you're here um, at this gear up to hear more about graduate school experiences. All right, thank you so much for the wonderful insights and a way to think about graduate school. 
We're going to transition now to our um, panel of graduate students. You know, the history of this event over the years has been, you know, we used to do a graduate school fair. And you know, over the years, we felt like, you know, students want to hear about experiences from students who are going through this and how they're emerging through their studies, how they made decisions in pursuing graduate school. So that's kind of the content we're, we're trying to get at tonight. Um, I want to introduce Jose Ars. He is uh, my wonderful colleague here at uh, the Career Center. He works for the Exploring Initiatives. Um, and Amy Kayleen will be on chat. So Jose is going to be moderator. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so any questions you drop in the chat, we'll try to get to those. We have some questions that are prepared for our, um, our guests tonight, our graduate students, but you know, we're gonna let the panel go where it takes us um, as it relates to what you want to know as a participant in this event. Thanks again for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to Jose. Thanks, Jose, appreciate your time here. And I will do my best to spotlight our graduate students so we kind of have an idea of, um, of who's contributing. Thanks all. Thank you, Chase. Like um, Chase just mentioned, my name is Jose Arce. I welcome all pronouns and I serve as the career education coordinator. Um, thanks for spending part of your night with us today and thank you to the panelists um, again for giving us your evening to share some wisdom um, and co-create knowledge together. Um, AB will be monitoring the chat, but please feel free to drop those questions because while we have those uh, pre-vetted uh, questions, we wanna know what you all are thinking about in the moment. So. Um, my first question for the panelists is if you can all start by introducing yourselves with your name, your pronouns, um, what program you're currently in, what you're studying, and then um, also what you studied in undergrad. So if we want to start with Alicia first, and then um, we can go alphabetical with Alicia, Kimmy, Jocelyn, Sonia, then uh, Taryn. Is Elisa joining us today? Let me double check. Actually, I'm looking in the boxes and I don't think I see her. Okay, then we will start next with Kimmy. If you wouldn't mind starting with your name, your pronouns, the program you're in, um, and then what you studied in undergrad. Sure, thank you so much. It's nice to be here, guys. Um, my name is Kimmy Conroe. I am currently a PhD student in the Department of Journalism and Media Communication here at CSU. Um, I completed my master's degree at Middle Tennessee State University, which is where I'm from. Um, and I, it was in the same program, in the media communication program. And then I also did my undergrad there in, um, gosh, I did a double major, double minor. I did biology and no, I'm so sorry. My, my major was electronic mass communication with a concentration in photography and also global studies, but I minored in biology and music. So just let that sink in like how diverse you can <laughs> make your studies and then end up somewhere and figure it out later. Um, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, great. My name is Jocelyn Munoz. I use uh, she, her pronouns. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. I am currently in the Master of Science in Biomedical Science. Yeah, a mouthful. Um, and through the College of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences. I studied under, in undergrad, I studied um, Spanish and microbiology. Is that me? Okay, sorry. I kind of got lost in the order. Um, my name is Sonia Dame. I use she, her, a pronouns. Um, I am a second year graduate student pursuing my master's um, of science in student affairs and higher education. Kind of like Kimmy, I kind of like took a lot of turns and I actually did my undergrad also here at CSU um, and I studied biology and biomedical science. Hi all, I'm Taryn. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am currently in the CCD program, which is the Career and Counseling Development program here at Colorado State. And I studied clinical and counseling psychology in my undergraduate. 
Awesome. Thank you all for taking a moment to introduce yourself. And you're already hitting on some of those points of what you studied in undergrad might not be what you studied in grad school and the other supplemental experiences you've had. Um, so my first question for you all is what motivated you all to apply to graduate school? Are we taking the same order? Awesome. Okay. Um, so for me, graduate school, I just, I knew that I wasn't done learning. Um, I was one of those students who changed their major a few times when I was an undergrad, and I used my undergrad to explore those various interests. Um, so I felt my undergrad had given me a foundation on which to build rather than served as that, you know, direct pathway to a career, kind of how Christina mentioned earlier. Um, oops, sorry, I muted myself. My apologies. Um, let's see, even though I had earned that double major and double minor, I knew that I personally needed more. I love learning. Um, and I wanted something more focused and in depth, um, to integrate all that I'd studied so that I could create something kind of meaningful for myself. Um, I also really liked that idea of, of becoming an expert in something. So I recognized I wasn't the kind of person that could pursue and accomplish that on my own. <laughs> So I need, I, I really need the structure and the expertise to lean on and the guidance from the mentorships that you develop at grad school. Um, so being able to lean on that with my professors has really been one of the best aspects of grad school. Um, they really know their stuff and moreover, they're really extremely dedicated to helping you develop your own identity as a researcher and as a professional and just helping you find what you want to do and give you the tools and uh, the resources to, to find that way. So for me, um, I didn't, I'm pursuing uh, medicine as my um, future goal. And so I decided on this path actually till later on in college, it's essentially like my last year. And so um, once I graduated, I still needed some courses. Um, long story short, I took some time to take, uh, take some of those um, prereqs for med school and um and worked in the at, at the same time and then um after that i decided that i think um i thought that my application could still be stronger if i had a master's and like kimmy i also wanted to um specialize or master or like become a master in something and in this case i forgot to mention actually my concentration for my degree is in anatomy and physiology so for me it was pretty relevant to what my next stepping stone or my next goal would be. And so um, it kind of just tied in together to, to um, gain this um, specializations that I could use later on and later on use for my patients. Um, so I actually had a few years gap um, between undergrad and this program. Um, and so what motivated me was becoming a better applicant as well as having the opportunity to really learn this material that I would uh, be using. And um, I also, to, to choose this program specifically, um, it helped that I had taken an undergrad course in anatomy and physiology, and I really enjoyed those courses. And um, it, that helped me choose this. And um, I was like, well, I enjoyed those. What if I have more time and and um, and a faculty that can help me really become a master in it? And uh, also another thing was that it's a one year program for mine, which is kind of rare. Um, I hadn't really heard about it before applying, and um, that was pretty attractive that I was just one year for a master's program. Um, it's also well known in um, in connecting. Uh, students to their next step, whether that's a professional uh, job in sciences um, or to uh, um, in a lot of cases, vet school or med school or um, even uh, PA school. Um, so that was pretty attractive and um, in knowing that um, this program was really well known and that, um, you know, it had a really good uh, record in uh, putting students into their next steps as well. And lastly, I think another thing that was attractive um, was um, not having to do research. Uh, I, I do like research, but uh, I didn't know if I, I wanted to spend that much time doing that. So um, having the time to just have coursework and, um, uh, was very 
uh, motivational rather than splitting my time with um, between both, which is still possible. I have a lot of peers currently that are doing both, but for me personally, I wanted to be able to just really dive in into the coursework and potentially in the future uh, still um, do research. So that was a little bit of everything for me. Um, I think for me, a really big driving factor is my family. And so every time that I talk about like why I chose graduate school, um, they always come up. Um, I really wanted to continue to grow um, and learn different things. And for me, it was really, it was a unique entrance into student affairs. I, um, I think that I wanted to go to med school. I, that, that was my goal. I did biology and biomedical science. Like, um, that's what, that was my dream was to go to medical school. And then as, you know, I, I pursued biology and biomedical science. I was around my fourth year. I did five years in undergrad. And so around that fourth year, I realized that um, one life happens. And so it's not always a possibility to do exactly what you want in the timeline that you want. Um, but I think also <clears throat> I was not as passionate about science as I used to be. And so um, I took a lot in, a lot of other interests in what I did extracurriculars after school and um, outside of academia. And so um, talking through mentors and talking to folks in the career center, um, it was very, I think, important for me that I still continue to do school, but just maybe not in STEM. And so part of the reason why I decided to do student affairs was because of all of the work that I had done in undergrad, um, working with students and um, supporting students, supervising students um, through different aspects of my um, undergrad experience. And so I think this was like a perfect way to continue to explore a new found passion of mine as I um, ended undergrad, which was to support students, um, specifically students with uh, marginalized identities who come from historically excluded backgrounds. And so um, that for me was kind of that newfound passion. And so student affairs just happened to be it. My motivation for grad school, I believe comes from wanting to have the ability to start working with the populations that I wanna work with sooner. I went straight from my undergraduate into my graduate school and I have my undergraduate in just psychology and the harder part with psychology and becoming a counselor is we can't practice until we have a licensure. And so because of that, I really wanted to get into a grad program that would be able to essentially get me on my feet sooner. And at Colorado State, there is a two-year program and it helps me be able to work with the people I want to work with sooner. And I also just wanted to be done with my schooling so sooner <laughs> because I'm the type of person, if I take a break, I won't come back. <laughs> and I know that. So I think also just knowing for your own motivation too is knowing who you are as a person and how school is for yourself. And for me, I wanted to work hard at getting all of it done as soon as I can, so. Thank you all. I think you've hit on some really great points about selecting programs lengthwise. Um, if you wanna spend a longer time in graduate school or a shorter amount of time, you've talked about motivations and some of them being that just natural hunger for knowledge, but also the personal, um, talking about family and being able to contribute to the global world. Um, I also love that you all started talking a little bit about um, timing. So do you go straight in after undergrad? Do you take some time off? Um, do you feel motivated if you did take time off? So. Um, I'm going to follow up on some of those thoughts, but um, my next question is, now that you're in graduate school, you've done all the work to apply to get there, you're in, what's been the most surprising thing about graduate school so far, so far, or being a graduate student? Sure, and, and I 
think it would be helpful to go ahead and throw in like I did wait a year between going from my undergrad to my graduate and then another year between going from my master's to my PhD and that was simply because I chose to start a family so I actually had a baby in both of those times um, and it's possible you know like it's it's tough but also that was like kind of one of those motivating things to kind of get me out of feeling like I was falling into like just a singular identity as a mom. <laughs> so um, there's a lot that can be done with that. And um, honestly, they've been like super supportive and very motivational. So in case that was ever, you know, a trade-off that you were considering, like, do I continue my education or do I start a family? Like they're completely uh, cohesive if you need them to be. <laughs> um, but in terms of things that really surprised me, um, the first one that sticks out to me is that I'll never forget uh, my first one of my it was one of my first classes and my my first year as a master's student and my professor he said hi my name is Dr Ken Blake but you should just call me Ken because we're peers now. He's like you are now colleagues of mine every graduate student from masters to, to PhD you're now on on our level. And the only thing that you're going to be doing over the course of the next couple of years is closing that gap. So I that really blew my mind. And it was kind of an identity crisis at first, because I I mean, like as an undergrad, there's just a huge chasm between yourself and your professors. Right. Um, but the coolest thing about graduate school is just watching that gap widen, like uh, decrease. Sorry. Um, so one thing that really was has been a shock, like a perpetual shock to me is just my ability to read really dense material in a short period of time and not just understand it, but synthesize that information through like critical analysis and like critiquing what's been done. Um, it's absolutely something that your professors will train you to do. Um, so every time that you're assigned a mountain of reading and you're just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> am I going to be able to get through this? By the time you're like halfway through it, you've suddenly realized, wow, I can do this. And this is really cool. Like I'm getting better at it. So everything that I've done in my graduate career has seemed daunting, but completely doable. And so I think that the, one of the biggest surprises for me is realizing that I can do all the things that I'm attempting um, from reading that ton of articles a week, which I will not, I'm actually using this week's readings to prop my laptop up so I can stand. Can you guys not see a ceiling fan hat? Um, but also to, um, to writing a 20 page research paper or an 80 page thesis. Um, again, I went the theoretical route, you guys, not everyone's gonna end up having to do that. But, you know, I found that I liked that. I liked that challenge. Um, if you think back to Dr. Quinn's flow model that she showed, you know, like you're, you're either like really scared and anxiety filled down here or else you're kind of bored up here. So like being able to challenge yourself and, um, and pushing yourself in that, those, you know, small spaces of discomfort are super, super valuable and important. Um, and another thing that I never thought I'd be able to do is stand up in front of a class of undergraduate students as their professor. And I actually, between my uh, master's and PhD, you know what I lied, it was actually two years between those two, I wasn't considering the pandemic, but <laughs> it was two years between that break, we all just forget that hazy year, I'm sure. Um, but I, I stayed on at my previous institution as an adjunct faculty member, and I, I was invited to do so by my mentor, my advisor. Um, he said, you're a really excellent writer, you can do this. And I'm just like, but, but wait, <laughs> is there a course for this? And he's like, no, you just do it. And you know, you lean on those around you, your department, and um, you seek out resources. Like we provide you with resources. And if you're ever on the fence about this, CSU has an incredible orientation program for entering master's students, entering PhD students that have never taught a day in their life. And they're coming in as GTAs and they have to suddenly like speak in front of a class and give lectures and then grade papers. And Oh, it's a really, really, really wonderful curriculum that they provide for us all free of charge. So I, um, I would let that ease your mind if you're ever afraid of that. Um, you don't have to teach, but as I'll mention later, it's such a great option for funding your graduate school. Um, but again, I, you know, I, I've now taught probably like 12 classes um, and most of almost all of them have been as the instructor of record. So I am the professor and it's still that cognitive dissonance between I'm a student and I'm a teacher is really tough some days. But um, again, it's just one of those things that you just surprise yourself with what you're capable of doing. And um, so 
don't forget that your program, your department, your your university, your professors are all there to guide you through everything that's challenging in grad school. Um, so you'll never be alone and you're always going to be supported. Um, and then one final thing that I'll throw out there at the risk of like upsetting anyone um, in grad school. You'll find that your grades don't matter to you quite as much as they did as an undergrad. Um, and I don't mean that to say you shouldn't be worried about them. It's just that your professors are no longer going to be concerned with, did they get a 100% of the questions accurate? They're going to be judging or crit critiquing and assessing your, your growth, your ability to work with the, the material and and make sense out of it and like articulate your thoughts clearly. Um, and, and for the majority of programs, not obviously not all of them, some of them are gonna be a lot more technical, but I'm, I'm speaking from my experience. Um, and it feels really good to, to get that stamp of approval without having to worry, was it an A, was it a B, was it an A plus, <laughs> was it a B minus? Um, so just one of those little pressures that's kind of, of um, filed down a little bit in grad school is that grades aren't really, the be all end all of your of your life <laughs> of your career they're not going to determine how successful you were because at the end of it you're going to walk away with a degree or not and no one's going to say what was your gpa during your master's degree <laughs> um okay that's all i have for that question i'm looking forward to hearing what uh, jocelyn has to say yeah i uh 100 actually agree with kimmy on everything she has had a uh, said about you know surprising yourself with being able to do what you never thought you could, right? And everything that seems intimidating, you are working through it, right? So I agree with all of that. And um, in addition to that, I would say that I was surprised at how much I actually enjoyed the material, even at how fast, and in my case, it's a pretty accelerated program because like I mentioned, it's just one year. So it's pretty accelerated. Uh, nonetheless, uh, it's so fascinating. And um, even with that challenge of the pace and the amount of material, just uh, what I'm learning about personally is just, um, it really motivates me to, you know, study the material and really get a grasp on it. So for me, um, it it definitely seems important to um, have a passion for, or that curiosity that was that, uh, mentioned in the beginning, um, because I think that's gonna fuel the long study sessions and the, um, the sacrifices that you have to do, um, um, not to scare you guys, but yeah, you know, um, it is a big commitment. And so, so if you have, um, the curiosity and passion to learn it, it'll make the hours seem like minutes. Like, and um, that's a huge part of it is that um, um, that you do have. To, I do feel like that for me, um, just learning about everything with so much is so much fun. Nonetheless, you still do have to commit a lot of time to it, um, and. Uh, so it does it does play a role in your outcome because I notice in, in some of my peers in in the same courses they they don't have as much interest and you can see them struggling to to just um, get themselves to study it or things like that but of course that can vary within within each person but um, um and I had an example of what Kimmy was talking about for example uh, I last semester I took a course in dissection where we were actually dissecting uh, um, cadavers that were donated. And um, this course was, um, you had to do hands-on and, you know, get to, through so, certain points in the body. And you really just had your book and your teammates, which were just three other people. And you kind of have to figure it out how yourself, how to literally dissect this and, um, and do it successfully without, you know, um, ripping arteries and nerves that are very hard to see and things like that. So um, in the moment, it seemed pretty, uh, you know, like, why are they making us do this so independently? Like, what are they thinking? This is so hard. Uh, but then at, um, as you start realizing, hey, like, this is actually helping me in so many ways and in so many skills and, um, and, and I think that's the beauty of it, that uh, there's lots of points where you're like, I can't do this. Like, what, what is going on, you know? 
And, and then there's moments where like, wow, okay, I got this. I can actually do this. I'm going to get through it. Um, I actually enjoy this. Um, it's all about that mental framework. And I think um, that was surprising for me how much of that mental framework um, plays a role in everything. And, and with that, I would just say the, um, the background that people have in terms of, they call like health hygiene, like um, um, making time to exercise, making time to sleep and making time to eat healthy and making time for your loved ones and partners and um, having a little um, um, awareness that, that um, all those factors will, will play a role in how much you enjoy the program. Um, and just, I think being aware that um, those will be critical and how you balance everything. Um, and, you know, I thought it would play a role, but um, it really, really plays a role in how successful you'll be or in terms of success. Well, it's not just grades, but like how much you'll enjoy it as well and how healthy you'll be in the process, if that makes sense. So I have a lot to say on that, but that's kind of just like an overall about that. <laughs> Is, are there any questions? I know I kind of touched on a good amount of things. Feel free to let me know. I could just throw in a quick echo of something you said in terms of like the community that you build while you're in the grad school is really crucial. Like your, co your cohort is every, it makes it so much easier because you're all in that boat together and you all get to discuss your research interests and like what you're learning together. So I think the community building is so much different than in grad school. I mean, sorry, in, in undergrad. So I yeah. think it's, it's, a, it's a much more cohesive and tight knit and it tends to follow you for like for years. So. For sure. We're actually um, highly, highly encouraged to study in groups and almost the whole cohort never did that in undergrad. And they always studied independently by themselves, just them. And we are encouraged to study with groups. And at first I was like, nah, I don't need to, but um, I definitely see the power in it and learning from each other and in talking about things. Um, so that's something that's, that's um, also surprising um, was studying in groups. <laughs> I think for me, like ditto to a lot of what has already been said, but that community piece, um, I think is super important. I also am in a cohort model. So we all are in the same, we all started together. We all take the same classes together, um, except for a few electives that folks get to choose from. Um, but <clears throat> I think it's like a super important part of my success in graduate school has been the community that I have built that I didn't think I was going to find. I thought I was just going to be like in class with people and like um, you study together maybe, but like the outside part of it and like the support systems that get created throughout, like that was super um, surprising to me that I didn't think I was going to find, which I really appreciate now. Um, I think another thing is that also what Kimmy mentioned, the grades piece. Um, I went from a very step, from a STEM major. So GPA is super important. Getting the good grades is super important. Um, it's super technical, like you get lectured, you take a quiz and then take an exam and then you get the grades for the class. And so sometimes it just felt like you're just studying for that one specific test and then all of that goes out the window and then you start for the next stuff and it just, it was that. And I think graduate school for me was, has been completely different. Like all of the knowledge builds on itself and you continuously, um, you, I still, in my portfolio, we don't have, I don't have a thesis, I have a portfolio. And so in my portfolio, I continue to write about things that I learned my first week of grad school. And so um, that building of knowledge and it's not directly tied to grades equaling success has been something that was super surprising and just like a complete 180 shift for me. Um, I think for most of my classes, actually my first and second semester, um, of graduate school, I actually had to choose my grade. Like I didn't get graded. I would have a conversation with my professor and I would dictate what grade I um, was to get. So again, it's, it's a lot of ref own personal reflection on your own knowledge and your own growth and your own learning um, that again, that might be specific to my program, but I think is it's very real in graduate school where it's like grades don't matter as much. And you can always just say you got an A and then move on. <laughs> Um, 
Um, and I think, yeah, I think those two for me were like the really big pieces that I found to be super surprising once I'm in the program, for sure. Yeah, and similar to what has been said by everyone else, classes that I have been in are a lot more individualized in that sense of we get to have conversations with the people next to us and with our professors and be able to build that community. So I noticed from coming from undergraduate at CSU where your smallest classes were like 30, 40 people and your biggest was like 300. My biggest class in my graduate, I think was 19. And that was like, oh, I don't know if we should have that many people in here. So it was very, val it's been very valuable to have um, that discussion piece, like what Kim just said in the chat too, where the discussion that you have with your colleagues and being able to go more in depth about what you're learning and be able to have those questions. And if we don't have questions, it seems weird because we're learning all these new things and being able to then apply that knowledge that we're learning from just our readings to real life. And even in my, <clears throat> excuse me, my program, especially being counseling skill based, learning how to use all of those skills. So it's been super surprising in that aspect of just the small classes, similar idea grades are really not a huge deal and just how in depth relationships can be. Thank you all. Um, I want to sum up some of the great things you all mentioned. You talked about the classroom size, getting to have a more intimate educational space, especially if you went and your undergrad degree was at a large university. Um, I definitely echo that. My largest class in undergrad was 600 students, um, and it was very scary. Um, so going to graduate school is really cool. Um, the idea of having cohorts and peers in your classroom who um, not only understand what it means to be a grad student, but are going through it and you can learn and grow with each other. Um, and then that idea of respect of having faculty members um, view you as a colleague, because that's what you are now. You are part of the discipline, um, whether you take that degree into more an academic space or into um, an industry, um, you're still a colleague of theirs that they're going to call upon of saying like this alumni entered this space um, um, after getting this degree. Uh, so thank you all. I have a question now from the audience. JC wanted to know, um, how do you navigate the financial aspects of graduate school, especially looking at meds, uh, medical school, such as veterinary school, and the debt that can come with that? And then I'm going to mix things up to keep things fun on this Wednesday afternoon. So let's go backwards. Let's do Taryn, um, Sonia, Jocelyn, and then Kimmy. Yeah, when it comes to the financial bit, I was privileged in the idea of being able to have a sports scholarship. So I've been using that for a while. And the hardest part is just being willing to apply and reaching out to even CSU here where, where should we be looking? Where are grants available? Where are areas that I can be getting scholarships? And also knowing that you don't have to go through school all at once. There's plenty of people in my cohorts too where they take one or two classes a semester because we have um, a person there with a newly born child. So she takes one class a semester and being able to slowly go through her master's program and it doesn't have to be done as quickly as some people are able to do it. Yeah, that backwards thing threw me for a loop, I'll say it. Um, <laughs> um, for me, I, I'm also very privileged in the sense that my program pays my entire uh, tuition and I get a stipend. So the way that that worked for me is I got an assistantship. Um, some folks will get research assistantships, um, others, mine specifically within my program, it's a, just like I work in an office um, within student affairs. And so I work in campus activities here at CSU. Um, and so my assistantship actually, this department actually pays for my tuition. And then all I'm responsible for are the fees. But on top of like the tuition remission, I also get a stipend um, every month 
And that allows me to one kind of cover the bills and stuff, but also to pay for those student fees. And so I think I would recommend a lot of research on specific programs and areas of study because certain areas of study, like I know student affairs is a very popular um, degree program in which uh, assistantships kind of provide that tuition remission. And so you kind of don't have to worry a lot about um, funding, for example. And I think that when I was thinking about maybe applying to a STEM program, I know toxicology and that BMS program that Josephine is in, I was um, interested in at one point. And my biggest thing was asking like, do you have research assistantships? Do you have um, other places of funding? I think just being very honest and open to communicating with the departments and um, those specific programs, because every program is so different and they all offer different types of funding. Um, I think that would have, be like kind of my biggest advice with how to navigate the financial aspect. I think also one of the biggest reasons why I didn't necessarily want to pursue medical school was because of the financial burden that it was going to come with. And so I think not to deter anyone or anything, but I think for me, um, it was one of the reasons why pursuing something else was more appealing. Um, and so yeah, I think each program is super specific to their funding and the amount of I think funding that they could provide, but I think it's a really important thing that you just ask questions. I think it's the biggest. Be curious and make sure you talk to those folks and make sure you, like through informational interviews or something like that, um, you get kind of all those questions answered for sure beforehand. So for me, it's a little bit different. I um, am not doing research and I think um, that can play a role in, um, financial aid. Um, so for me, unfortunately, I am paying everything um, myself. I, I unfortunately um, don't have financial support from my family, um, but I am privileged enough that I didn't have uh, loans from undergrad due to scholarship. So I think that helped um, not have that pressure. Um, and it also did help that I worked um, for a few years between undergrad and this program just to save a little bit um, for spending money. But I guess I'll be vulnerable and say, yeah, like I'm paying this program with loans and I had zero knowledge about this whole process since I'm a first gen. Um, and and um, the school was very supportive in, in financial aid office, the counselors, I would meet with them. and and try to become a little bit more literate in, in finances and um, you know what I should be looking out for or how much I should be taking out or not. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that there is support that can help you navigate it, um, uh, especially at the school. Um, they're very nice about everything. I had the most basic questions like, where do I request it? Like everything. So um, they are very supportive in terms of that. And um, I think for me, I was able to sleep at night knowing that, you know, the knowledge is worth it. Uh, you're paying um, to, you know, become specialized, like we mentioned earlier. And I think um, it's definitely worth it um, not for the knowledge itself, um, but also um, because there are jobs that pay more if you do have a higher degree. I was looking, um, just applied to one and the wage was definitely different than before my master. So that's also could be a, um, a helpful thing to know that um, there could be higher paying jobs with that higher degree. Um, and in terms of med school, um, I think it ties into that, that um, how once I would graduate med school, um, I would have a higher paying job to pay those loans as I go. So it is a lot, but um, you do have almost a guaranteed job. So um, it's kind of nice knowing that. Um, and it, also, your interest doesn't accumulate, um, at least it depends which ones you get, but I know at least for me, it doesn't accumulate when I'm, while I'm in school, so even if I um, um, start med school this fall, I wouldn't have my interest accruing since I'm still in school, but I guess that's a little detailed info, but yeah, I, 
it's possible. Um, it definitely, I feel, shouldn't be a factor that should deter you um, because um, knowledge is, is priceless, I guess, ironically. I like that knowledge is priceless, but it costs so much. Um, <laughs> uh, awesome points, everyone. Um, definitely. Um, the biggest thing on my list is do the um, assistantship if they offer it. Um, and from my experience from both masters and grad and PhD programs at different universities, also applying to a lot of different universities, that was one of my focal you know, checklists, um, did, do they offer an assistantship? And everywhere that I looked into had some form of financial assistance um, that covered most, if not all of it. Um, and so for my graduate programs, both of them, I got the same package, which, you know, different universities, um, they both offer that GTA ship. Um, and so that's what I did when I was an undergrad. I'm so sorry, during my master's and it, it covered, and, and for some reason, the fees were a little bit less at that university. So I ended up not having to pay anything. And that was pretty cool. And here it's just the fees. But um, what I really love about my program here is that I have the opportunity to also do a GRA, which is a graduate research assistantship. So I've gotten my teaching experience. I feel comfortable with that. There's always more to learn and more to practice, but I'm really grateful that I now have the opportunity to practice the research that I know I'm going to be doing anyways. And if that's something you're not sure, if you know you want to do, it's a great opportunity just to practice, to see um, if that is for you. And if, um, if you wanna know before you apply, you know, there are labs that you can apply for like a summer position. And I think that would be a great way to kind of expose yourself and see if that might be something that you would be interested in doing and pursuing. And um, so yes, if it's option, if it's offered, do it because it's not like, um, like Sonia said, it's not just your, your tuition being covered. It's a stipend as well. It's meager, but it is absolutely necessary, you know? Um, so my, it covers my rent. So that's, that's what I need. And um, it's a huge relief to know that that's, um, that's something that I don't have to worry about. And in terms of like scholarships and grants, I would encourage you if you're thinking about grad school now and you might be coming up next year, the following year, start looking now um, for external scholarships. CSU seems to offer a lot as well. I haven't gone through them. Um, and then also grants. There are a lot of different grants that are available and CSU also has a database that you can filter through them, which is very helpful. And so they'll just give you money if you, if you show them that you are going to produce something valuable with that. Um, it's wonderful. And then you also get exposed, you get networking opportunities a lot of times with those kinds of groups. Um, so you'll get to connect with people that are doing similar work in a different state or different university or different country even if you go for the big global ones. And so if you are in like the sciences area, I would highly encourage you to look at like the NSF uh, grants because that funds everything for like four to six years and, and gives you a hefty, hefty stipend for self expenses and research. I missed being able to do that by like a semester because of my gap year. So in, in terms of, uh, I think Liz was asking earlier about the gap year, that would be my only thing to point out is the one gap year was fine. It was me doing two with COVID that knocked me out for that just be between a master's and a, and a PhD. Um, you guys have already talked about professors and departments. Um, again, the research experience I thought was really great. In terms of loans, I... And for all intents and purposes, a first gen um, college student, my mom did like an online thing, like when I was already in college, I don't know if that counts. Um, it, <laughs> I don't know. It was like one, anyways. Um, and I had no idea about loans either. And I, I racked up a significant number of loans in my undergrad because I was taking my time and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So um, if you're able to, with this information, with this guidance that you're being presented here with today or through other you know, resources, try to do your research and look into opportunities that you can fund your school a little more intentionally. Um, for me, I just knew I wanted to go to college and I'm just like, okay, I'm here, now what? Um, and then one, one final opportunity, when I was a master's student, 
I did also do, in addition to my GTA ship, I also did a work study. And that was just an opportunity that was passed my way because I was at the same university as my undergrad. And again, I was a photography major. So I'm a, I'm a professional photographer by trade and the university photographer um, position opened up. So I applied for that and it was just a student worker position. So I got to train, you know, there's this whole other identity of mine that I was able to build up alongside my new identity. <laughs> so that was really wonderful and instrumental to a lot of things for me. And it also really integrated me into the university a very, very efficiently and effectively. Um, so if there is an opportunity and you do need money, you know, um, if you do have a family or if your rent is too much, um, work study options, as long as they don't interfere with the time that you need to, um, focus on your studies, they can be a really, really valuable resource, especially if they're really symbiotic to what you're doing. I don't have time to do that here <laughs> because I have two kids and a grandmother that I'm taking care of. So <laughs> just saying, um, but yeah, uh, there, there are many ways to finance your education. And I actually do have one insight that is not my own. Um, my husband and I are both like full-time learners. So we met in school and he uh, was just starting his MD PhD. And so he actually, there are programs. So if you're interested in something like that, there are programs that will reimburse you for all of your tuition. Now, I don't have any more insight into that <laughs> besides that they are out there. So Vanderbilt University, for instance, and it's a very prestigious university, a research teaching hospital. Um, I think they had just opened up this MD PhD program at the time. And they said, if you make it through, we're gonna, they hold the MD hostage. <laughs> so you do two years of your MD, you complete your PhD, four to seven years, whatever it takes. And then you come back and you have like one more year of your PhD, or I'm sorry, of your MD, and then you get the whole degree and then they wipe the slate clean. So like $500,000 is just like now not ours. You know, like it was, it was cleared. So there are, there are those opportunities. So um, if, if that is something, if you know, you want to go to med school, like look into different kind of programs that might allow for that. And if you like research, then an MD PhD is already right down your alley. That's awesome. Y'all are giving some, oh, sorry. Um, you're really good, giving some great insight and some additional places you might, or things to consider are, um, not only the financial compensations, but thinking about like health insurance. Um, a lot of times in your graduate experience, like you might be turning 26, you might be getting off of your family's health insurance. And so how are you affording that? And um, some graduate schools will give you student um, insurance for free. Also um, thinking about being a first generation college student. I know for me, it was just vibes as I selected those loans. And in my head, I was like, someday somebody will pay that. I don't know if it'll be me, but um, I didn't necessarily do it with such uh, grace that you all have talked about. Uh, but another uh, area of compensation is looking for identity-based scholarships so and grant funding and fellowships. So if you um, are an underrepresented identity within certain fields, so being a woman in STEM, being a person of color within education, um, being first generation, um, they'll often provide some um, form of stipend or uh, fellowship funding. So those are additional places to look at. Um, I know time is getting close, but I know some of our panel did take time off. And so I wanna um, bring it back to Liv's question, uh, Liz's question um, and talking a little bit about that gap year experience and like what um, motivated you to get back to grad school? Because that's often the question we hear is, well, if I take time off, I'm scared I won't come back. So what motivated you to come back after taking a gap year? I think it just maybe might be Kimmy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I did, I did mention this in the chat. Um, I loved being able to do that. And again, mine was kind of intentional because I started a family, you know, it gave, but, but in, in terms of if that's not, if that's not what's happening in your life right now, <laughs> um, it gives you a time to focus on something other than school for a little while. And I did, you know, I was so six years in an undergrad and that was a lot even for someone who loves school so much. Um, and it made me miss, it made me miss the university life, the, the grind, the, 
um, the deadlines, the, the motivation. And I think for me personally, and this is actually not very like illuminating, um, I need that kind of structure. I'm getting a lot better at it now, <laughs> like self-pacing and self-starting, but I, I needed that drive. I needed that push. I needed those regular deadlines. Cause I realized I had this list of things that I wanted to do whenever my school was out. And then as soon as school was out, I was just like, yeah, I can just sit down. <laughs> Um, so rather than actually do those things, I found myself like wallowing and in, in apathy. I was just not, I was just displeased. I was discontent. I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with what I wasn't, wasn't doing. So going back to school immediately gave me that boost and, and it pulled in it. And there's also mom brain, like that is a thing. And so I couldn't string my sentences together very well anymore. So I like going in and having to discuss, Heidegger and Marx and, <laughs> and just like philosophy. And then my first semester which just completely pulled me out of that. And I was able to articulate in writing again, just like having a space for that. Um, but yeah, just knowing that that was good for me was a, was a big push for that. So maybe if you know that you really like school and like keep it on the back burner, if you want to take a, a year off or kind of set yourself, if you want to be like more intentional about it, set yourself a goal and say like, for this year, I'm going to accomplish this, but then this is my deadline where I'm going to start working on my applications. Um, uh, like, you know, three months in advance, if you need, um, and then this is the deadline by which I'm going to have, you know, like already have done that work on the, at the far forefront. So that way it's already started. You have somewhere to pick up like a sticky note, like, remember me, <laughs> remember what I wanted, <laughs> you know, seven months ago. Um, and that could be really helpful because it's you convincing your former self or your future self. Thank you, Kimmy. Um, so as graduate students, you're often tapped to um, take on a couple of things, whether that's um, personal um, aspects of like raising a family or serving as a graduate teaching assistant. Um, what's the best advice you can give to our future graduate students of the world in balancing it all, um, balancing the classroom, balancing research, and that additional layer of like, now you're often the grown up in the room when undergraduate students are looking for support. Um, how do you balance that all? I'll for start. me, I would say, oh. You got it. I didn't know which way we were. Okay. <laughs> me either. I, I don't know if I missed that, but for me, I would just say um, to balance for me, what helps me is literally Google Calendar. It's my saving grace. I, If I'm going to exercise, I put my hour in there. If I'm going to have a meeting, I put it in there. I literally put in everything and I can see what I need to get done. I can see, um, did I put my social hour in there? You know, um, so I think that just um, helps, but being intentional about it and saying, you know, I'm going to try to be um, intentional about, about my schedule and um, about what I need to get done and um, balancing everything. For example, I have two exams um, tomorrow, well, one tomorrow, one on Friday, and um, I'm still in this meeting <laughs> because I made sure that I would work around this and um, plan accordingly. So you really have to do a lot of planning and um, that's how you can balance is planning and making sure you're prioritizing. Um, um, would you rather, you know, there's, there's a lot of options that you can do that aren't your priorities, let's just say. So just making sure you know what your priorities, do you prioritize, you know, spending an hour with your partner or, um, I don't know, watching Netflix or doing both at the same time, maybe. And then that way you can study or something. I don't know, whatever it is, knowing that you have priorities and knowing that you have uh, time limits. I know for me, like I mentioned, I'm in a very fast paced program. So I'll have a lot on my plate in terms of a load of work, but just knowing, okay, if I get this done within this time frame, that means I'll have time for this other thing and I'll have time for this. So a lot of just planning and self-discipline. Those are the two big things like self-discipline and like, and, um, and staying with that schedule, or even if you don't, just making sure you're able to work with it, if that makes sense. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, 
I think for the best advice I could give going into grad school and trying to manage everything is one, the same idea that Jocelyn was bringing up of a planner and also taking time to fit in what you actually enjoy because that will fill your bucket to be able to actually do more things and be fully present and mindful in every experience that you're enduring during grad school. So whether that's like running, yoga, taking time with like animals, whatever it is, it's just finding that time to be able to find yourself too because it gets overwhelming and you start only seeing grad school being right in your face. So that's my best advice and knowing that even reaching out to your advisors and supervisors and everyone saying, hey, I'm having a hard time balancing what's, what's something I can do. I even have teachers that are like, you know, this is a deadline, but if you turn it in a week late, I don't really care. So everyone's super accommodating when you get to a level of meeting similar what Kenny was saying. Um, I think for me, I, I struggle a lot with the word balance um, because I don't feel like there's a balance to anything. For me, I, I prefer to use the term manage, like how do I manage um, like both of these things because I have yet to find a balance. And so, um, and I'm, I'm going to graduate hopefully in May. Um, so I would ditto like on, I use Outlook instead of Google Calendar, but that's just because well, that's what the university uses. And so I definitely plan out almost everything. Um, I also I agree that like finding the time to give, do the things that bring you joy and bring you happiness and kind of like what Terry was saying, fill your bucket because there will be times, like especially for me right now as I'm finishing up and wrapping up my portfolio, like all I'm thinking about is grad school and all I'm thinking about is writing and all I'm thinking about is finishing. Um, and it becomes like super overwhelming. And so for me, it means like going to the movies. I love going to the movies. And so um, I go with my cohort, I go with my partner, whatever. Um, I go with both of them and our cohort loves Marvel movies. And so we rent out like the theater, uh, the cinema here in Fort Collins uh, rents out the theater. And so like our whole cohort will just pitch in and we'll do that. Um, yeah, see, I, I love Marvel. So, and it's just like, we find little pockets of community care right now. We're all going to have dinner and then we're going to go right. Um, and so find little pockets of like, maybe you have to continue to do grad school and school stuff, but how do you bring in other aspects that bring you joy into that? Like for me, it's writing with my, um, with my cohort members. And so um, I think that would be for sure in time management. I think it's like super cliche and like typical, a, a typical answer, but I think it's super important for folks to like understand like how much grad school takes out of you, especially if you do it in assistantship because you're working for me, it's, I work in this office. I supervise about 25 students um, and I work 25 to 30 hours a week. And then I still have to do school. And then I still have to like, I have a, a long-term relationship. I have a partner that I have to spend time with and, and cater to that relationship as well. And I have a dog that I have to like take out and go on walks with and give attention and, and love to. So it's a lot. And I have friends, right? My cohort and like my community that I have to spend time with. And so figuring out like those, a lot of those pieces, um, was really actually really difficult for me my first year because I didn't know how to navigate like how to deal with so many different um, aspects of grad school that I just didn't anticipate. Um, and so I think, yeah, just finding those pockets like of, of community care. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure like how I feel um, have led me to like be able to manage my time or manage my experience in grad school much better, yeah. So well said, I, like I sympathize with everything you just described. Um, and to that point, I would highly encourage you. I actually, I would, I would implore you focus on something that you love. You know, this becomes your life for a while. Um, 
and, and again, they tell you where my, my leaders have always told me, my, my mentors have always told me and my classmates pick a research topic that really interests you because you're going to be living in it. <laughs> so for me, I took on like the woes of the world and I'm researching misinformation and disinformation campaigns and, and fake news right now is like all that I can think about. Right. Thank you guys for pulling me outside of it because otherwise I'm just, I'm writing a literature review and it's a lot, but um, also it's a little mildly devastating. But um, I think as everyone has pointed out, um, time management becomes like one of the most critical aspects of your experience and um, becoming a master of time management is kind of part of becoming being a grad student, I find, because I'm constantly at the beginning of every semester trying to reinvent the wheel for, okay, how am I going to be more organized this semester? <laughs> how am I going to be more successful? Um, and I have gone through many different ways, y'all. But um, one thing I'll drop in the chat right now, I think is really cool. And this is actually something Dr. Quinn pointed me to last year at the beginning of the semester. Um, like the Todoist, they have an app for, man for managing your stuff. Um, but they also have like this productivity like quiz that you can take to see what what approach to productivity management is best for you based on the way that the way that you approach your, your problems and manage and organize your life. And I thought that was really cool because it tells you something about yourself. I love those stupid online quizzes. They tell you something about yourself that you didn't already know. Um, so I would highly encourage you to take that quiz and then they have so many resources that they'll flood your inbox with if you want, or you can just read through their pages at your own leisure about how you should approach, you know, for me, it's eating the frog, tackling the biggest, most daunting task before all of those tiny little tasks. So I'm not one of those people that gets that little little boost from winning small things, because then I'm just pushing off the thing that's stressing me out <laughs> until the end of the day. And I don't get to it because I'm tired. Um, so yeah, finding your productivity um, path forward is super, super critical. Um, and refining it perpetually for the rest of your life is basically what you'll be doing <laughs> from what I understand. Um, but in terms of how overwhelming things can be from time to time, um, I just keep thinking, A, I love it. I love it. Everything I'm reading, I love. Even if I don't love it, I still love it. Um, and ultimately, I'm just practicing becoming an expert in doing what all these other people that I admire wholeheartedly are, are capable of doing. So it kind of goes back to the thing I mentioned at the beginning is that I'm learning that I can do things that I never thought I'd be able to do before. And I think that's pretty damn cool. And I'm going to be a, you know, a scholar that's producing this work that the people that I'm citing might one day cite, you know, like, that's so cool. You're contributing to this world. Um, and in terms of like what we have on our plates, I have to get up, you know, I have to leave by 5.30 in the morning tomorrow for a flight to Orlando for a conference that I'm presenting my research at, which is like one of the funnest, funnest is not a word, one of the most fun aspects of um, being a scholar and doing research is that you get to go and present your work and to peers and like, and you're going to rub shoulders with people that you cited. And that's like mind blowing. It's like stardom of the scholarly world. And it's so much fun. Um, but I love doing that. It's so neat. Um, and you get to be, you see, you actually see yourself physically in, in that world from that moment on, like I've, I've presented at one conference before and, and it would, and when I was a master's student and it was so cool because I'm, I'm there, I'm doing it. And like, these people are telling me like feedback on my work, that's going to improve it and situate it within the scholarly realm. So I love, I love, love that aspect of it. Um, but one huge thing that I would say is make sure you're getting your sleep. Um, <laughs> that was the thing that I always shoved to the side. You know, if I put in 12 hours of reading and writing in a day and I realized, you know, it's like, I have to submit this thing. It's 3 a.m. And then I have to get up at 3, you know, at 6 a.m. And it's just, it's not sustainable. It hurts physically and you can manage it. You can take those shortcuts elsewhere in your day. So getting six to eight hours is something that, like, especially as you get older, it hurts more. <laughs> I just turned 32 last week and I'm telling you, it just hurts more not getting enough sleep. And so, and it's going to happen from like 25 down. So just like be, be prepared if you're not already 25, like that's the, that was the year that everything just like suddenly started to shift slightly, slightly, slightly. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you are scheduling your you time, whatever that is and, um, and sleeping enough. Uh, if that's all that you take away, like you're going to be pretty sad. <laughs> Thank you for the birthday wish. <laughs> um, 
really quickly, if we can all just give a quick virtual round of applause to our panelists for taking time, like you all described, like you all gave us time of your very busy weeks and I'm very appreciative. I remember being a grad student and an hour sometimes feels like 10 um, if you're in a really big crunch time. And so thank you all for um, allowing us to spend some time with you this evening. Um, thank you all for all the wisdom and sharing your um, personal experiences navigating this really intimate experience. Oftentimes where we feel lost when we think about looking at our continued education and how do we navigate this and can feel very isolating. So I appreciate it. Appreciate you all sharing those um, testimonies there. Um, we're gonna wrap up for the uh, sacredness of our time and thank you all again to our panelists. Um, Chase, Amy and I will stick around a little bit longer um, to about six for any lingering questions, um, but thank you all, I um, really appreciate it. Also, Kimmy, great hearing that you're going to Florida. I'm from Florida and Orlando is really close to my hometown. So even hearing that made me very happy. Oh, yeah, I'm excited. Even though like the weather had to become beautiful here right before I left. <laughs> it couldn't have left last week when it was just too cold to breathe outside. No, I'm excited. Thank you. Winter's back this weekend, so good timing. Perfect, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Still not quite beach time though. Mm -mm. No, but Orlando is beautiful. You'll get to see palm trees, um, depending where